special guests. You can like make your own um, opinions. But this is Dr. Jennifer Adams from the University of Calgary, who I first met when I was there. And she came in and delivered this awesome workshop about the difference between um, SOPO and um, research informed teaching and uh, the way she laid down the difference between them and how no prisoners taken she was about it was absolutely awesome. And I wished like someone explained that before I was in the field that far. Um, but she has a very interesting and very complex background. Oh yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the two pieces of that background that I hope I get right and I hope I relevant, she has MA in education, mm -hmm. and then she has a PhD in a field that is, it's an urban science, no, urban education in Which STEM, in science specialization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she's also a Canada research chair in a field that's called creativity in STEM. So without, I'm not gonna say anything else because I'm probably gonna get it wrong, but I am very excited about this talk and I hope you are as well. So okay. welcome. All right, well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me and I'm you know, glad to be here to talk to you today. So yeah, so thanks Anya for that, um, you know, for that introduction. And yeah, that's, that's exactly what I am. But just to give you a little bit of background about me, I am originally from New York City. I taught in public schools for a while before working at the American Museum of Natural History and then pursuing like post-secondary science education where I have been since. So today, what I wanted to talk to you about is that, um, you know, creativity and creativity in connection to science. So just to start, um, okay. it's not advancing. Is this supposed to? Well, I'll do some. Oh, how am I, yeah, is this supposed to? Okay. Okay. Yeah, so you know what? It's not going to want to play. Seems like that. So, what I wanted to show you was a song, and it's caused by a group that's called Ibeye. They are an Afro Cuban um, Canadian, French Canadian duo, and they sing this song called The River. And when I was walking along the river one day, as I like to do, because in Calgary, there is the Bow River that runs through the middle of the, um, of the city. And usually in the fall, the river is pretty low. It's very crystal clear. And you can see like the rocks underneath. And then there's some yellow leaves that are floating down and it's really pretty. So I was noticing this river. And so I posted um, this, um, the video of the river, which won't play right now. And these words or these lyrics from the song River by Ibeye, and it's carry away my dead leaves, let me baptize my soul with the help of your waters, sink my pains and complaints, let the river take them, river drown them, my ego and my blame, let me baptize my soul with the help of your waters, those all means are so ashamed, let the river take them, river drown them. So when I posted it on Facebook, as we do with all of our experiences now, one of my colleagues responded to it. She goes, that sounds like a hydrology pro poem. So, <laughs> oh, so, oh, look, the river is, see, see how pretty it is and the river is going now. So now it's working. So it made me think about like this notion of science and how what Ibeye was singing about is a hydrology pro um, 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 poem because that is how the river works. And they're talking about how the river works, but really talking about it from that lived and that spiritual um, you know, um, connection. But then also it's that creative aspect because they did create a song about this and that's how they are communicating their knowledge of the world in connection to the spiritual, connection to the lived and also the scientific. So it made me think about that notion of creativity and how we know and understand and share our experiences about the natural world. And what would happen if that's what our institutions were based on? Like if we um, valued creative and cultural expressions as scientific ways of knowing, or if we expanded scientific ways of knowing to include these creative like and embodied expressions, like what would that look like if we were all like doing real transdisciplinary research where these perspectives were brought into bear into not only the types of questions that we ask, but how we choose to address those questions the um, inferences that we make and everything that comes as a result of it. 
So there's a river going again. So today what I want to do is to talk about first, like how is, what are the ways that creativity is connected to human knowing and scientific knowledge production? When did the separation occur? Why is it important that we engage um, creativity in STEM and what are some possible ways to approach that? So science and artists, and these are some of the things that again, we, I talk about in my um, creativity, equity and STEM lab. And there's a, and a lot of the stuff that, and you'll see pictures of um, people that are in my lab or some, mostly my students, but in the lab, what we do is that we really talk together, theorize, do research, just about like equity, creativity and STEM. So some of the things that we talked about, you know, we think about science as a form of creation. We get these ideas also from the literature. One, you cannot create science. You cannot create knowledge production without creativity. Even the sciences that we have today, those happen as a result of creativity, but they just become enclosed over time, as I will talk about. And some of the ways that some of the similar processes that happens, there is imagination. There's visualization, there's problem solving, there's addressing important issues and topics of our time, there's communication. These are just a few of the things, but these are some of the ways that they're connected. The picture that's there, that is from um, Annette S. Lee, who is an astrophysicist and also um, indigenous, I think, Cree Lakota. And this is one of her artworks and what she really does in her work. She has a um, lab that's called Sky Watchers and really integrating that indigenous and that Western science way and really working with indigenous cultures to remap the skies and to look at how they name the stars and to really layer those upon Western um, sciences, science understandings of the universe. So we can go back in the beginning of time and we can see like through um, examples of cave art found all around the world that these are the ways that humans have used creativity. This is the ways that we've documented um, what we know about the natural world. This is the ways that we've communicated our knowledge about the natural world. Then the natural world was to us very integrated. It was about the human lived experiences. It was about that ongoing documentation of what happens and then making adjustments and developing technology in order to respond to what happens and in order to utilize things that they found in their natural environment. And it was also what we don't often talk about in science. It wasn't, it wasn't separated from what people would call like the spiritual aspect when people had these very land-based understandings of how the world worked. So what happened? When did we become separate from these, um, from these ways of knowing? So Western modern science, if we think back to Com um, Thomas Kuhn's work about um, the nature of paradigms, he really talks about how these paradigms come from very specific ways of knowing and the zeitgeist, you know? So starting, if we think back to the you know, famous year 1492, along with what's called the Columbus Exchange, while we know that there have been travels you know, across the ocean and people exchanging um, information, objects and trade you know, before 1492, but this era saw the mass movements of animals, of plants, of people and disease around the world. And so, this kind of began like where we had to learn or as humans or Western or, or you know, cause all of this was coming from Europe, wanted to learn how to leverage this and harness this necessarily for profit. Along the same time, um, you know, and this maybe sound familiar to today that they were dealing with a wave of the black plague, one of the subsequent waves. So through all of this time, trying to understand and trying to explain what was happening with this, with this disease. So there was, this, there was this, um, this desire to control nature, to fight against the recurring pandemic. That pandemic and this, this was where the shift from knowing and feeling to logic and reason became the valid form of scientific knowledge production. And this is where the disciplines as we know them now so like the chemistry, the physics, et cetera, they didn't always exist. They were codified into disciplines. And this is where these disciplines started to emerge as they are now. So then we go to the enlightenment. And then this is where scientific modernism took hold, where it was more about um, centralization of you know, concentration, accumulation, um, efficiency, the fragmentation, because if we think about it, this is when we started to really look at nature, separate them. Oh. There it goes. Separate them down into parts, 
like that were not necessarily like in categories that were not how they were found in nature. So if we think about classification and things like that. And so the societies, the um, no, learned societies were formed too. So, and this is where also, also which is um, funny, like the separation between these learned societies and universities. Universities were then designated as places where known knowledge was you know, given or bestowed upon learners. And these societies was where the knowledge, scientific knowledge was produced. And we still see that today, if we think about where our learned societies are, how old they are and what happens. These are the conferences that we go to. And this is where people are disseminating research and talking about scientific knowledge production. And then when we get into the universities and our classrooms, they're still taught from that perspective where we're expecting students to already know known or learn known facts and not really engaging them in scientific knowledge production until later on. And this is where the scientific method was established. And then this is where like the, the disciplines were further codified. And then we think about the 90, 19th century where there was an exponential increase in um, scientific knowledge production in Europe. This is where some of these, and I'm using the botanical gardens as an example, and as well as race and scientific racing, racism. These were there where these things emerge and they emerge again from this particular worldview, way of studying the universe and way of documenting life. So the botanical gardens, we can think about this, is, this is just a quote from one of the um, people who has studied this. Um, they undertook plant transfers and scientific plant development that resulted in new plantation crops for tropical colonies, thereby altering patterns of world trade, increasing the plant energy, the human energy in the form of unpaid labor that European core extracted from the um, tropical peripheries of the world. So the Royal Botanical Gardens in London is a part of this. Um, there's also, I know, a Royal the Kew Gardens in Jamaica as well. So they had them in all of these colonial outposts. The Dutch did that with Indonesia as well. So all of these colonial outposts and served as places that developed scientific knowledge. So they did the um, you know, scientific method experiments and everything in order to harness nature for profit of the empire. And this is where race science also was codified. So this was the idea that humans divided into separate unequal races. And it was a scientific explanation for the contradiction between the belief in human um, equality expressed during the, the revolutions and the emergence of slavery in the United States and in several European countries. And also to explain away the theft of indigenous land and labor as well. So it was, you know, and it became like the justification be behind many um, immigration policies, because we think about immigration policies in the United States, in Canada as well, because I recently learned that there was a um, migration of black farmers from the South because they were promised land in Alberta, but when too many of them were coming up, it was like, nope, we can't have this up here happening, you know, and then they, you know, develop policies to prevent that from happening. So Jim Crow laws, Nazism, fascism, these were all justified by science, what was deemed empirical science. And we can still, and they shape the ideologies about race today. Even though we know that science has debunked, debunked the notion or the biological basis for race, race and racism still exists. And that plays out in science in many ways. First, it plays out in who is deemed um, you know, appropriate or who is deemed scientific to study science. So think about all those people that are you know, enclosed and, not, um, and have more challenges to pursue science. Also, it affects like how um, you know, the effects that science have on different people. While we know that there are scientific advances that help to improve our lives in many ways, but then when we think about you know, um, you know, the, um, the racism underlying it, for example, like artificial intelligence, those are, you know, data is trained on human biases. So that's going to obviously have detrimental effects to some people over others. Environmental racism, we know that communities of color, lower income, in, um, income communities, they are more adversely affected by pollutants and other things in their, in their um, communities. Um, more recently, there was um, a young um, doctor, a young African doctor 
who developed a, um, a, you know, a diagnostic book that showed how skin conditions look on people of color. So prior to that, medical doctors were trained on models of Caucasian skin. So not knowing how these different um, you know, issues showed up and they look like on people with darker skin. So these are just some of the ways that because of how science has been produced over time, how they affect how, how different people have lived their experiences and also are included in scientific knowledge production. So the enclosure of science. So coming from, this is a performance artist, Josefina Baez, say it again, science has not been neutral nor colorblind, hurt could not cure. Because we can talk about numerous um, examples of, especially in medical research, where they were done on enslaved bodies, like all that we know about gynecology, the person that was considered the father of gynecology did an ethical research on enslaved people. So we can think about things like that and you know, the experiments that the Nazis did on Jewish people and how that contributed to scientific knowledge production. So yes, hurt does not cure. And then we look at STEM, like, and this is just me, I Googled, you know, cause I like to put pictures in my PowerPoint. So, and I've been doing this each time, you know, just look at scientists. These are the images that come up. And I know I've done this with like students and what do you see about these images? They're all very sanitized looking. There's all like, and while now more recently, they show some diversity of people, but everybody still in essence looks the same. They're all practicing science in the same way. So this narrows the um, images that people have of what science is, how it is practiced and who practices. Because you don't see anybody in the field. You don't see anybody teaching. You don't see anybody not wearing a lab coat. And yeah, it's great that you have safety stuff on, but this is not how all scientists dress and look, if you look at all of us today. You know, so this is what I like to show because of why and what the detriments are to having an enclosed science. So, you know, young herpetologists with some Girl Scouts, do turtles have periods? Do they have periods? Okay, no. Do snakes have periods? No, reptiles don't have periods. Oh, do bats have periods? We know of four species of bats that have periods. Does it, does it fly when it has this period? I don't know. Does it hang upside down when it has this period? I don't know. Why don't you know? The researchers who study those, speech, those species haven't answered those questions. Oh, are they boys? So <laughs> what does this tell us? It tells us that perspective matters. So now if there were more women that were historically studying, you know, different species of animals, maybe we would know more about the menstrual cycles of bats and other mammals. So this, um, the book, Who's Asking, and I just put this long quote up there just because I think there's a lot of relevance, but I highlighted the important points because, um, you know, we know of Jane Goodall, we see her, you know, studying on primates, but most of all of the early studies were done by men and they, they adopted a very Darwinian view of evolutionary biology. Even with that Darwin Darwinism and that competition, that notion of competition, that is coming from a very culturally specific world view where there is a hierarchy of human beings, there is a hierarchy of gender. And so that's seen from that perspective. So they always focus on competition against amongst males for access to females. The idea that females may play a more active role and might even have sex with many males did not receive attention until female biologists began to do field observations. And what did they see what men missed? And you know, when a female um, biologist or saw, um, you know, they, they basically followed them into the field, they didn't dismiss certain behaviors that they were observing. So that's empathy. And oh, I mean, I mean to turn that, yeah. And so empathy, and that's an important thing because we start to think about how with, along with creativity being removed from science, some of those more effectively related terms such as empathy and feeling were also removed. When you're studying, like, you know, many things, there is a certain degree of empathy that helps you to think about how this might affect other people other than yourselves. 
how might this influence other people or how other people might be thinking about this thing. So looking at the primates, you look at a bunch of primates, they're related to us. So what are you seeing in their behavior that may be reflective of your own perspective? So now if you bring multiple perspectives to bear, you're going to have a more holistic view of how primate societies operate. And that's coming from this book, um, Who's Asking? And it's a you know, good book that shows like, um, you know, well, native um, and Western science and thinking about how these things integrate in science or could integrate in science education. So it shows that different orientations towards a natural world make for more effective science practice and science education. Um, despite the view that science is objective and scientists do not shed their cultures at the laboratory or classrooms, their practices reflect their values, belief systems, and worldviews. And that's something that we should always be questioning. Like, who are we in relation to what we're doing? And the participation of researchers and, education, and educators with different cultural orientations provides new perspectives that leads to more effective science and better science education. Again, who you are is very important to what you know and what you do. So just going to some of the work that I've been doing in my lab, we first started with, um, because when you know 2020 happened and then the murder of George Floyd really awoken people, especially here in Canada, that there is, there is racism here, you know, that there is a racial issue. Because I remember the protests that happened in front of where I live, Memorial Drive, which is a very busy street. And a lot of people held signs that said Canada is not innocent. And so, of course, a lot of universities jumped on the bandwagon, you know, like uh, with the equity thing. But prior to this, my, um, my research group, we thought that this is a good, op this is an opportune time to really bring this research agenda into the play. Because prior to that, there was resistance in, you know, talking about, you know, there was plenty of talk about gender in um, science, but there was a lot of resistance to talking about race and science or that intersection of race and gender in science. So what we did was that we got together and we collected um, surveys and we did some follow up interviews with people. This was what was completed as of um, July 2021. As of now, we had, I think, 15 interviews. We stopped interviewing now, but we'll probably bring that back up again. And so we're looking at um, and we came up with some emergent themes. But what I want to share today is just some representative quotes from students. And one of the things that we've been talking about in my lab in response to reading um, both um, Fikile Nuxmalo and Eve Tuck, who are both here in OISE, thinking about more desire-centered research versus damage-centered research. So rather than emphasizing on the harm that people of color experience in these places, what is it that we desire? So what I did was we, I looked at these quotes and then inter just reinterpreted them, you know, just a quick reinterpretation in desire. So you can read like, you know, the blue quote, but the desire. So based on this student's experiences, I desire to be accepted and valued for who I am and what I bring to the learning relationship. I desire to be related to as a human being and not through the lens of race or gender. Okay, so this one, I desire not to have to prove myself because of my ethnicity. This one, I desire not feeling out of place because of my skin color. I desire a space where human differences are recognized and valued. I desire to be myself in school. I want to wear my hair in an Afro and dress how I like without worried about being perceived as ghetto or unprofessional. So what is the way forward so that we have students that are realizing their desires in STEM teaching and learning and in STEM education places? So now I'm just gonna talk about some of the work that we've been doing in the lab that has really been around like both like our own, both our research, the empirical research, but then also in faculty dialogues about um, you know, increasing creativity and equity in STEM. And so we have a community of practice and the community of practice is around expansivizing place for equity in STEM. We do structured dialogues and co-generating meanings 
And with the question about how can we lose, use a lens of creativity to create spaces of belonging in STEM. And expansivizing is a term that refers to the infinite possibilities of learning when different resources are combined, as well as the options for many different configurations of learning. And these resources not only include like physical resources, because you know in science, in order for effective science to happen, whether you're teaching it to three-year-olds or you're teaching it to fourth year students, it requires those physical resources that are there. But then we also think about the intellectual resources, the people resources, all of these resources that are coming together and using creativity to reconfigure them and to think about how we can use these resources makes for a more expansive and ways to, um, to teach science. And of course, it's not without messiness and tension, but then as people, as, we, as scientists, we know, that things often do not go as planned. And it's a matter of having that reflection about what worked, what didn't work, and what can I do the next time that I do this. So what we did in this community of practice, because again, like I started with just thinking about creativity and STEM, and then thought that I would do like the long route into equity. But then when 2020 happened, that provided a shortcut, which was good. So using one of um, my colleagues definition, so thinking about creativity, especially in this sense that's connecting it to learning, uh, thoughts and actions that lead to novel adaptive reproduction, the creative capacity, the level of complexity or sophistication at which an individual engage, engages in creative practice at a point in time. So this, I like this definition because that means that we all, we all have that creativity and we all start from somewhere. And as, um, as people who are designing learning environments and learning experiences is how are we going to shape it so that people can increase in their creativity over time. And it's not a linear increasing, but it's more of a reiterative one with growth through um, each cycle. And the creative practice is original research bringing ideas into fruition. And I know we talked a lot about what that notion of original research is. And what that original research means is that at some at the early point in developing scientific creative capacity, it's original what is original for that learner, you know, so there are things that you who are advanced in the field may think, well, that is obvious, but to somebody who doesn't have experience in the field, but wishes to become more proficient in the field, to them, it may be a aha moment. You know, it may be the light bulb that goes off, but it's, amount, it's about allowing them to have their ideas and to have ways of bringing those ideas into fruition. And then what, it, what underpins, and this is coming from one of my um, colleagues at UC Davis, who's now at the National Science Foundation. So when we think about um, our professional learning, you know, we think about, well, first of all, what is professional learning? Learning to teach is ongoing. Learning to be a professor is ongoing. So it's not something that you just get a degree in, you know, or you just start to teach and you get, you know, good reviews and that's it. It's an ongoing process. It's a process of learning about who you are as an instructor and learning about your students as diverse human beings in the classroom. Reflection is very important. It's always important to like reflect on what you're doing, why, what is happening, what is working, what are students saying as they're doing this, what are they doing, what is their feedback to me. And going beyond just the, um, the annual evaluation, because there's been like, I don't know why universities still do it, because there's been tons of research that shows that those evaluations are not necessarily accurate, you know, because first of all, you're going to get students, mostly the disgruntled students that are going to be the ones that I'm going to fill this out right now because I didn't like that class. And then, you know, you may have others, but it's not, and especially, and they also saw, um, show that women and faculty of color are more treated more harshly in those um, evaluations than white males. So that's something to consider. So what you need to do as an instructor is to figure out what are other ways that I can look at or examine how effective are my, um, uh, am I teaching? You know, how effective? And there are different, and we can talk about different like um, informal ways of doing that. But one simple way is just walk around. If you have like, you know, if you have that, um, you know, that capacity like in your class, walk around, 
and listen to students as they're talking, you know, ask them questions about what they're doing in a non like conf confrontational way, just have a conversation with them. And that can give you an idea about our students learning what I'm expecting them to learn, you know, are they engaging it like it, what I'm hearing in the conversation. Is this what, um, you know, does this sound like what I'm hoping that it sounds like and if it doesn't what kinds of questions could I ask them to help get at what's happening there. And then, you know, critical consciousness. So this is where, when we start to talk about equity, we, you know, think about how do we recognize and analyze systems of equality and then the commitment to take action. And then we had a, um, and I have a, a slide that's coming up that talks about the, um, the faculty learning um, group, but I, yeah, I'll talk more about that. And then solidarity consciousness, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then importantly, in science, we often focus on content. You know, we want students to have a good understanding of the content. And that's all well and good, but we need to more focus on students as learners, as human beings. And then the content, like, so it's about why is it important for, this, for these human beings to know this particular content? And then we start, that makes you start to think about what is the relevance of this? What is the relevance of this to larger society? And also what is the relevance of this to whatever the students' goals are? So whether they wanna to go to med school, whether they wanna to go to um, further graduate studies, whether you wanna convince them to you know, become a physis physicist rather than going to med school, what are the goals? You know? So thinking about, again, the students as humans and some of the terms that are being used now in, um, in science education and thinking about this is belonging. So belonging, creating these spaces of belonging, feeling, being and feeling like one is welcome and a valued member of a group. So as we showed you from the um, BIPOC climate study, and there's like a lot of other studies that show that, that often, they often complain that students of color, women, and people at the intersection, non-binary um, genders, and whatever intersections that they have, that they often do not feel that they belong. They don't feel, they feel other than these spaces. And then flourishing is social, psychological, and academic well-being. So we want to create these spaces where our students feel like they belong, and when they are belonging, they will actually flourish. Okay, so one of the things that we like to do too is think about students as partners in learning. So thinking about how we can collaborate with students in learning. And this could be like a big collaboration of redesigning a course as one of my um, colleagues done, or just in small collaborations on different activities, or just in collaboration and thinking about them as collaborating in their own learning process. So how can you engage them in that process so that they are able to take agency over their own learning? So one of my um, students, undergraduate, came in as an honor student. She wanted to look at this notion of risk and creativity because she felt that there, was no, there wasn't creativity in the classroom because students didn't feel comfortable in taking risks in learning. So she was able to do a small research project where she interviewed her own, um, her, her, you know, her peers. You know, to, she wanted to see first how they divine, the design creativity, how they define risk in the classrooms, and what they thought were ways to create um, safer classroom environments. So this is how she did her, um, her research. And these are what some of the themes that she emerged after she went through all the interviews and found connections that they, they, the students define scientific creativity as trying something new or different, presenting their knowledge to others. So thinking about different ways of presenting their knowledge engaging in expansive learning activities. So learning activities that continue to build on, um, you know, previously learned skills in that kind of way, you know, opportunities for expansive thinking. So again, being able to make those connections in different ways and pursuing their passions or interests. So these are, you know, again, from the words of students interpreted by a student. So I thought this was relevant to share just because this is where um, this is coming from. So how they, what they perceive as risk in the classroom. So they called it stepping outside of their comfort zone. You know, so that one, I know that she said they saw that both as a positive risk, but then it also can be a negative risk depending on the environment. Participating in the activities for fear of not being um, perceived as smart, not being perceived as scientific, asking and answering questions, so raising their hands and being able to ask questions or even going in to um, professors' offices and asking for help. 
and then grades. And we know that grades, that's always the risk because especially for students who have been high achieving, achieving um, A grades, taking risk can mean a lower grade and which may be a risk that they're not, or, or to them, they think it may mean that. And then how do they think that um, the, to create safer classroom environments? So they said student-teacher relationships, relationship building they felt was very important. So thinking about ways to, you know, to again, that humanize the professor, because remember a lot of students still see this person in front of the classroom as being this kind of like unreachable person. So what are some of the ways? And they talked about, you know, professors walking around the classroom, asking them questions, maybe like, how was your weekend? Simple things like that, um, using pronouns, different things like that of ways of humanizing. I mean, humanizing, having clear expectations, because some students felt that if there weren't clear expectations, so even if you're doing something open-ended, letting students know that this is an open-ended activity and the expectation are is that you will engage in this activity and do the steps to it and we will together learn and see what happens. And the balance of guidance and choice. So they liked being able to have that guidance, but then also choice in how, um, in how to achieve the route that they wanted to. And one of the things that my, um, one of my graduate students has been talking about and really thinking about um, labs and how to give students choice. And if we give them too much choice, that may be overwhelming. So she's thinking about how can she structure a lab so that they have two paths, two paths are good to follow. They can read about and they can choose a path and then justify why they chose that path over the other. So that's getting at, that's, and that's also a way of showing that they really do understand the purpose of that lab, the purpose of that process, and then it becomes a part of like, well, what do they want to learn most about it? So another thing that we've done with the community of practice, and I did this with my colleague um, out in um, UC Davis who created the other heuristic that I showed you earlier, in the faculty, because these are, these are terms that often come up when we're talking about um, equity in STEM or equity in general. So, and people tend to get defensive when we start to talk about things like power and privilege and oppression. So rather than getting offended by it, we talked about, we, we designed this so that people can actually read about, talk about what these terms mean and how these terms show up in STEM. So that becomes less personalized but then it's also about, um, you know, it becomes less personalized, but then it also with the positionality, it also situates people <clears throat> within that web so they can see what role they're playing in all of this. And we can know that we, there are places where we all have power and we all have privilege. And then there are other places where we don't because of gender, because of race, because of socioeconomic status, first generation status, many, many um, different things. So these are some of the faculty reflections from doing that, um, that faculty learning community process. So what they learned, because we focus it, we structured it a lot around dialogues, um, talking to each other, developing shared meanings about things, talking about the ways that they've showed up in both the individual and collective. So <clears throat> how to run effective discussion that gives all participants the space to speak, because that's always something that we often talk about in group dialogues and things. Some students may not speak. It's about structuring it. And we had, a bunch, we had several different structures that people that we use in order to ensure that everyone had a voice. And then whoever was going to be the spokesperson for the group, other perspectives um, were included. Notion of positionality was new to me. Our conversations around positionality helped me to better understand how powers and privilege operate and hierarchies that we construct. I learned about positionality and how my positionality affects life and how I see things, aware of more other, others' positionalities that expect their studies or academic journeys, both positively, positively and negatively. Um, compassion goes beyond empathy. It involves a desire to improve the lives of well-being and other people in the classroom. So these were some of the reflections from the faculty and there's like more, but I couldn't fit them all on one slide. We also ask them after the, you know, after the process to think about um, actions that they will take. So um, they would, you know, and I really like this one. I typically do not spend much time discussing mathematicians in my mathematics course. I will, with more intention, include a discussion of who does mathematics in an effort to humanize the activity of doing mathematics. So giving them like a purpose, like why is this done? So that they're not just these abstract numbers on a board, but they're actually people who are generating and using and doing these mathematics. 
actively highlight diverse STEM contributions in instructional content. So citing is political, not just waiting for some type of like, you know, um, black history or Asian Pacific history or women's history month to highlight diverse scientists, integrate them in a part of it. If you're talking about something and there is a diverse scientist that has done this work, highlight so-and-so uses this in their lab, blah, 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 and just move it on and not, and normalize it. So you're not making a big deal out of highlighting, oh, there's this, you know, there's this black woman that did this. It's like, this is a scientist. This is what she done. Keep it moving, you know? Um, facilitating discussions with other faculty and department around shared readings and things, and being intentional about facilitating student group work and discussions. So, you know, some of the things that, you know, we just kind of, um, with my um, students, I guess what we say, and we just condense these into approaching humanizing and anti-racist STEM, being intentional, being relational, being, you know, having humility, empathy, and then being reflective about one's practice. And all of these things, they open up that space for creativity. They open up that space for students to bring their perspectives in. And when people are bringing diverse perspectives in and bringing them in relation to one another, that is where the creativity happens. So I just wanna thank, because a lot of this wouldn't be possible without members of my lab. These are all of them, and actually the one in the middle at the bottom, she's from the University of Toronto. So she works as a research assistant um, remotely. And, and, and yeah, so, and that's, that's it for, for now. Thank you.